All right, boys and girls, I do believe this is going to be our last episode. So we're going to wrap up the book here. We know that they've rescued Rhyme and Reason, and here we go. Let's see how it all resolves. Chapter 19, The Return of Rhyme and Reason. Sailing past three of the tallest peaks and just over the outstretched arms of the grasping demons, they reached the ground and landed with a sudden jolt. Quick, urged Talk, follow me. We'll have to run for it. With the princesses still on his back, he galloped down the rocky trail and not a moment too soon, for pounding down the mountainside in a cloud of clinging dust and a chorus of chilling shrieks came all the loathsome creatures who choose to live in ignorance and who had waited so very impatiently. Thick black clouds hung heavily overhead as they fled through the darkness, and Milo, looking back for just a moment, could see the awful shapes coming closer and closer, just to the left and not very far away, were the triple demons of compromise, one tall and thin, one short and fat, and the third exactly like the other two. As always, they moved in ominous circles, for if one said here, the other said there, and the third agreed perfectly with both of them. And since they always settled their differences by doing what none of them really wanted, they rarely got anywhere at all, and neither did anyone they met. Jumping clumsily from boulder to boulder and catching hold with his cruel curving claws was the horrible hopping hindsight, a most unpleasant fellow whose eyes were in the rear and whose rear was out in front. He invariably leaped before he looked and never cared where he was going as long as he knew why he shouldn't have gone to where he'd been. Horrible hopping hindsight, kind of funny. And most terrifying of all, directly behind, inching along like giant soft-shelled snails with blazing eyes and wet, anxious mouths, came the gorgons of hate and malice. No thanks! Leaving a trail of slime behind them and moving much more quickly than you'd think. Faster! shouted Tuck. They're closing in! Down from the heights they raced, the humbug with one hand on his hat and the other flailing desperately in the air, Milo running as he had never run before, and the demons just a little bit faster than that. From off on the right, his heavy bulbous body lurching dangerously on the spindly legs which barely supported him, came the, get this guy, overbearing know-it-all, talking continuously a dismal demon who was mostly mouth. <laughs> he was ready at a moment's notice to offer misinformation on any subject. And while he was often, while he often tumbled heavily, it was never he who was hurt, but rather the unfortunate person on whom he fell. Next to him, but just a little behind, came the gross exaggeration whose grotesque features and thoroughly unpleasant manners were hideous to see, and whose rows of wicked teeth were made only to mangle the truth. Cool. They hunted together and were bad luck to anyone they caught. Riding along on the back of anyone who'd carry him was the threadbare excuse, a small pathetic figure whose clothes were worn and tattered and who mumbled the same things again and again in a low but piercing voice. Well, I've been sick, but the page was torn out. I missed the box, but no one else did it. Well, I've been out sick, but the page was torn out. I missed the box, but no one else did it. Remember, he is nothing but an excuse, right? He looked quite harmless and friendly, but once he grabbed on, he almost never let go. Closer and closer they came, bumping and jolting each other, clawing and snorting in their eager fury, Talk staggered along bravely with rhyme and reason, Milo's lungs now felt ready to burst as he stumbled down the trail, and the humbug was slowly falling behind. Gradually, the path grew broader and more flat as it reached the bottom of the mountain and turned toward wisdom. Ahead lay light and safety, but perhaps just a bit too far away. And down came the demons from everywhere, frenzied creatures of darkness, lurching wildly toward their... Pray. I'll just stop right there for a moment and show you this illustration. Here are these creatures, the characters that we just introduced you to. Take a look at that. 
not exactly folks you'd want to hang out with. Ah. Here we go. Oh, we've got a live viewer. That's exciting. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> From off in the rear, the terrible trivium and the wobbly gel gelatinous giant urged them on with glee, and pounding forward with a rush came the ugly dilemma. Snorting steam and looking intently for someone to catch on the ends of his long pointed horns while his hoofs bit eagerly at the ground, the exhausted humbug swayed and tottered on his rubbery legs, a look of longing on his anguished face. I don't think I can he gasped as a jagged slash of lightning ripped open the sky and the thunder stole his words. Closer and closer the demons loomed as the desperate chase neared its end. Then, gathering themselves for one final leap, they prepared to engulf the first, first the bug, then the boy, lastly the dog, and his two passengers. They rose as one and suddenly stopped. As if frozen in midair, Unable to move, staring ahead in terror, Milo slowly raised his weary head, and there on the horizon, for as far as the eye could see, stood the massed armies of wisdom. Remember, they're, they're trying to escape ignorance, and they're headed to wisdom. Keep that in mind. The sun glistening from their swords and shields and their bright banners slapping proudly at the breeze. For a moment, everything was silent. Then a thousand trumpets sounded, then a thousand more, and like an ocean wave, the long line of horsemen advanced slowly at first, and then faster and faster, until with a gallop and a shout, which was music to Milo's ears, they swept forward toward the horrified demons. Look at these. There's the, the forces coming to help. There in the lead was King Azaz his dazzling armor embossed with every letter in the alphabet, and with him, the mathematician, brandishing a freshly sharpened staff. From his tiny wagon, Dr. Discord hurled explosion after explosion to the delight of the sound keeper, while the busy din collected them almost at once. And in honor of the occasion, Chroma the Great led his orchestra in a stirring display of patriotic colors. Everyone Milo had met during his journey had come to help the men of the marketplace, the miners of Digitopolis, and all the good people from the valley and the forest. The spelling bee buzzed excitedly overhead, shouting, Charge! C H A R G E! Charge! C H A R G E! Can be, as everyone knew, was as cowardly as can be, ha ha ha, came all the way from conclusions to show that he was also as brave. And even Officer Shrift, mounted proudly on a long, low dachshund, ha, ha, ha. perfect size for him, right? Galloped grimly along. Cringing with fear, the monsters of ignorance turned in flight and, with anguished cries too horrible ever to forget, returned to the dank, dark places from which they came. The humbug sighed with relief, and Milo and the princesses prepared to greet the victorious army. Well done, stated the Duke of Definition, dismounting and grasping Milo's hand warmly. Shake his hand, right? Fine job, seconded the Minister of Meaning. Good work, added the Count of Connotation. Congratulations, proposed the Earl of Essence. Look, he's reading from his parchment there, the scroll. Got things to say. Cheers, recommended the Undersecretary of Understanding. And since that's exactly what everyone felt like doing, that's exactly what everyone did. It's we who should thank, began Milo when the shouting had subsided. But before he could finish, they had unrolled an enormous scroll. And with fanfare of trumpets and drums, they stated in order that, and before I read this to you, I'll show you. Remember, author's craft is when the um, author chooses to use a different font and appearance to kind of convey a different tone. Isn't that neat? Cool font, isn't it? Very old fashioned. Henceforth and forthwith, let it be known by all men that rhyme and reason reign once more in wisdom. Oh. The two princesses bowed gratefully and warmly, kissed their brothers, and they all agreed that a very fine thing had happened. And furthermore, continued the proclamation, the boy named Milo, the dog named Tok, and the insect hereafter referred to as the humbug are hereby declared to be 
heroes of the realm. Yay, cheer after cheer, fill the air. And even the bugs seemed a bit embarrassed at having so much attention paid to him. Therefore, concluded the Duke, in honor of their glorious deed, a royal holiday is declared. Let there be parades through every city in the land and a gala carnival of three days duration, consisting of jousts, games, feasts, and follies. The five cabinet members then rolled up the large parchment and with many bows and flourishes, retired. Swift horsemen carried the news to every corner of the kingdom, and as the parade slowly wound its way through the countryside, crowds of people gathered to cheer it along. Garlands of flowers hung from every house and shop and carpeted the streets. Even the air shimmered with excitement, and shutters closed for many years were thrown open to let the brilliant sunlight shine where it hadn't shined for so long. Hadn't shone for so long, excuse me. Milo Top and the very subdued humbug sat proudly in the royal carriage with the Zaz, the mathematician, the two princesses, and the parade stretched for miles in both directions. Wisdom is something to keep cheering on. As the cheering continued, Rhyme leaned forward and touched Milo gently on the arm. They're shouting for you, she said with a smile. But I could never have done it, he objected, without everyone else's help. Right, you guys, we learn better with each other. That may be true, said Reason gravely, but you had the courage to try, and what you can do is often simply a matter of what you will do. That's why, <clears throat> said Azaz, there was one very important thing about your quest that we couldn't discuss until you returned. I remember, said Milo eagerly. Tell me now. It was impossible said the king, looking at the mathematician. Completely impossible, said the mathematician, looking at the king. Do you mean, stammered the bug, who suddenly felt a bit faint. Yes, indeed, they repeated together. But if we'd told you then, you might not have gone. And as you've discovered, so many things are possible, just as long as you don't know they're impossible. And for the remainder of the ride, Milo didn't utter a sound. Finally, when they'd reached a broad, flat plain, midway between Dictionopolis and Digitopolis, somewhat to the right of the Valley of Sound, and a little to the left of the Forest of Sight, the long line of carriages and horsemen stopped, and the great carnival began. Gaily striped tents and pavilions sprang up everywhere as the workmen scurried about like ants. Within minutes, there were race courses and grandstands, Sideshows and refreshment booths, gaming fields, Ferris wheels, banners and bunting and bedlam almost without pause. The mathematician provided a continuous display of brilliant fireworks made up of exploding numbers which multiplied and divided with breathtaking results, the colors, of course, being supplied by Chroma, and the noise by a deliriously happy Dr. Discord. Thanks to the soundkeeper, there was music and laughter, and for very brief moments, even a little silence, which we know is her favorite, right? Alec Beings, remember him, set up an enormous telescope and invited everyone to see the other side of the moon. And the humbug wandered through the crowd, accepting congratulations and recounting in great detail his great exploits, most of which gained immeasurably in the telling. He was that drunk. And each evening, just at sunset, a royal banquet was held. There was everything imaginable to eat, King Azaz had ordered a special supply of delicious words of all flavors. And for those who liked exotic foods, in all languages too. The mathematician had provided innumerable platters of division dumplings, which Milo was very careful to avoid, for no matter how many you ate, when you finished, there was more on your plate than when you began. And of course, following the meal, came songs, epic poems, and speeches and praise of the princesses and the three gallant adventurers who had rescued them. King Azaz and the math magician pledged that every year at the same time, they would lead their armies to the mountains of ignorance until not one demon remained. And everyone agreed that no finer carnival for no finer reason had ever been held in wisdom. But even things as fine as all that must end sometime. And late in, on the afternoon of the third day, the tents were struck, the pavilions were folded, and everything was packed ready to leave. It's time to go now, said Reason, for there is much to do 
and as she spoke, Milo suddenly remembered his home. He wanted very much to go back, yet somehow he could not bear the thought of leaving. And so you must say goodbye, said Ryan, patting him gently on the cheek. To everyone, said Milo unhappily. He looked around slowly at all of his friends. See the moment you could tell the, the illustrator has such talent that the way he draws their faces indicates their emotional state. You can see that. He's so gifted, even though the drawings are so simple, right? To everyone, said Milo unhappily. He looked around slowly at all the friends he'd made, and he looked very hard so as not to forget any of them for even an instant. Most, But mostly he looked at Talk and the humbug with whom he had shared so much the perils, the dangers, the fears, and best of all, the victory. Never had anyone had two more steadfast companions. Can't you both come with me? He asked, knowing the answer as he said it. I'm afraid not, old man, replied the bug. I'd like to, but I've arranged a lecture tour, which will keep me occupied for years. And they do need a watchdog here, barked talk sadly. Milo embraced the bug, who in his most typical fashion was heard to mumble gruffly, Bah! But whose damp eyes told quite a different story. Then the boy threw his arms around Tok's neck and, for just a moment, held on very tightly. Thank you for everything you've taught me, said Milo to everybody as a tear rolled down his cheek. Doesn't he sound grateful, do you think? And thank you for what you've taught us, said the king, and he, as he clapped his hands, the little car was brought forward, polished like new. Milo got in and, with one last look, started down the road with everyone waving him on. Goodbye, he shouted. Goodbye, I'll be back. Goodbye, shouted Azaz. Always remember the importance of words and numbers, added the mathematician forcefully. Surely you don't think numbers are important as, as words, he heard Azaz shout from a distance. Is that so, replied the mathematician a little more faintly. Why, if... Oh dear, thought Milo. I do hope they don't start at it again. And in a moment, they had faded from sight as the road dipped and turned and headed for home. I'm going to go ahead and finish this last chapter with you. It's um, 20, goodbye and hello. Maybe it's goodbye to boredom and ignorance and hello to wisdom and wonder and curiosity. Just maybe. As the pleasant countryside flashed by and the wind whistled a tune on the windshield, it suddenly occurred to Milo that he must have been gone for several weeks. I do hope that no one's been worried, he thought, urging the car on faster. I've never been away this long before. The late afternoon sun had turned now from a vivid yellow to a warm, lazy orange, and it seemed almost as tired as he was. The road raced ahead in a series of gentle curves that began to look familiar, and off in the distance the solitary toll booth appeared a welcome sight indeed. In a few minutes, he reached the end of his journey, deposited his coin, and drove through. And almost before realizing it, he was sitting in the middle of his own bedroom again. It's only six o'clock, he observed with a yawn. And then in a moment, he made an even more interesting discovery. And it's still today. I've been gone for only an hour, he cried in amazement, for he'd certainly never realized how much he could do in so short a time. Milo was much too tired to talk and almost too tired for dinner, so without a murmur, he went off to bed as soon as he could. He pulled the covers around him, took a last look at his room, which somehow seemed very different than he'd remembered, and then drifted off into sleep, a welcome sleep. School went very quickly the next day, but not quickly enough, for Milo's head was full of plans and his eyes could see nothing but the toll booth and what lay beyond. He waited impatiently for the end of class, and when the time finally came, his feet raced his thoughts all the way back to the house. Another trip, another trip. I'll leave right away. They'll all be so glad to see me, and I'll... He stopped abruptly at the door to his room, for where the toll booth had been just the night before, there was now nothing at all. He searched frantically throughout the apartment, but it had vanished just as mysteriously as it had come, and in its place was another bright blue envelope, which was addressed simply, For Milo, who now knows the way. He opened it quickly and read. Here's what the letter said. And again, author's craft. It's printed on the page like a letter format at the bottom and then up here at the top. Notice the difference in font. It helps you really get into the mode of, I'm reading a letter. This is to Milo. Dear Milo, 
you have now completed your trip, courtesy of the Phantom Tollbooth. We trust that everything, everything has been satisfactory and hope you understand why we had to come and collect it. You see, there are so many other boys and girls waiting to use it too. It's true that there are many lands you've still to visit, some of which are not even on a map, and wonderful things to see that no one has yet imagined. But we're quite sure that if you really want to, you'll find a way to reach them all by yourself. Yours truly. The signature was blurred and it couldn't be read. Hmm. Milo walked sadly to the window and squeezed himself into one corner of the large armchair. He felt very lonely and desolate as his thoughts turned far away to the foolish, lovable bug, to the comforting assurance of talk standing next to him, to the erratic and excitable din, to little Alec, who he hoped would someday reach the ground, to rhyme and reason, without whom wisdom withered, and to the many, many others he would remember always. And yet, even as he thought of all these things, he noticed somehow that the sky was a lovely shade of blue and that one cloud had the shape of a sailing ship. The tips of the trees held pale young buds, and the leaves were a rich, deep green. Outside the window, there was so much to see and hear and touch, walks to take, hills to climb, caterpillars to watch as they strolled through the garden. There were voices to hear and conversations to listen to and wonder, and the special smell of each day. And in the very room in which he sat, there were books, that could take you anywhere, and things to invent, and make, and build, and break, and all the puzzle and excitement of everything he didn't know, music to play, songs to sing, and worlds to imagine and then someday make real. His thoughts darted eagerly about everything he looked at, looked new, and worth trying. Well, I would like to make another trip, he said, jumping to his feet. But I really don't know where, when I'll have time. There's just so much to do right here. And that's the end of the book. Notice the look of curiosity on Milo's face. Do you see his body language? He's leaning forward with interest, which is so different from how we started with the story. He was so bored and disinterested and everything was blah. And this experience, the quest for knowledge, he was, he learned that really everything around him was worthy of his curiosity. And so he is no longer bored. He has found a way to um, engage in the world, stay curious, and find his place in it. And that is what I hope for you as well. Thank you for listening to this book. We'll talk soon.